there's a massive misconception about me because I get this a lot. Everybody thinks I'm fearless, right? And I'm not fearless at all. Like to be fearless is to be ignorant of the consequences, right? I am well aware of the consequences. Um, I just try and calculate my risk. And then, you know, there's just something so empowering about feeling the fear and then standing up to it and overcoming it. Like that feeling is so empowering. Like that's actually what I'm addicted to. You know, like I'm addicted to the rush of riding waves and everything, but really it's, it's overcoming that fear. You know, everything that you want is on the other side of fear. Welcome to Black Belt Beauty Radio, a podcast fueled by a passion to support your journey in developing your most beautiful and optimal performance in life. Each episode is driven with the intention to elevate your mind. When we elevate our mind, we elevate our life. So get ready. It's time to rise. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Black Belt Beauty Radio. Okay, you guys, I am so excited to finally get my forever friend, one of my very best girls, Kayla Kennelly, on the show for you. In addition to being one of the best female surfers in the world and arguably the best female big wave surfer on the planet, my girl is also a world-class DJ, an LBGT and women's right activist, an actress, and a motivational speaker. This Hawaiian-born badass is the definition of high performance, not only in athleticism, but also in the way she uses the power of her voice to advocate for the change and action she wants to see made in the world. Kauai born and raised, Kayla grew up surfing with surfing icons Andy and Bruce Irons, charging some of the island's heaviest waves and eventually started competing against them in the youth competitions. She turned pro at 17 and began competing around the world on the WQS tour and quickly moved up to surf against the best on the WCT. She spent a decade ranked in the top 10 on the ASP World Championship Tour. And by 2003, Kayla peaked as number one in the WCT rankings before ending the year as the second best female surfer in the world. Being the multi-passionate crusader that she is, Kayla decided to take a break from her surfing career in 2007 to pursue her love for acting and for music. You may recognize her from the renowned film she starred in, Blue Crush, or from the HBO series, John from Cincinnati. It was in that phase of her career life. Kayla then decided to depart from the WCT tour, where her surfing felt limited to a certain style, and instead decided to chase her passion for surfing big waves. Kayla has since been a true pioneer in creating groundbreaking performances in some of the heaviest waves, shattering glass ceilings in her sport and proving that women are just as courageous, skilled, and as badass as the men are in the sport. One of the most outstanding recognitions outside of being the current WSL's women's big wave champion was when Kayla became the first woman to be invited to compete and the renowned Eddie Eichau big wave competition at Waimea Bay. You guys, I cannot even express how big of a deal that actually is, especially with Keala being a born and raised Kauai girl. Since Keala has cemented her presence in the world of big wave surfing, she helped to establish a woman's big wave tour and holds a vital role in the committee that was responsible for winning the fight for women's equal pay in surfing, all surfing, in 2018. This was a true milestone accomplishment for Kayla in her long list of accolades, and she now has it set in her heart to further this accomplishment as an advocate for equality and pay across all of women's sports. So here's the thing, you guys. With all of those incredible facts on Kayla, I literally haven't even scratched the surface to my girl's list of accomplishments and accolades. Some of the greatest accomplishments live outside of her career life. Her resilience is remarkable. Her demonstration in how she battles mental health issues, how she's faced death and risen back up from traumatic injuries, and what it took for her to finally come out and show the world a truth that she kept locked up within her in the earlier parts of her life are nothing but outstanding. To be fully transparent, this intro 
was so daunting at the thought of it because it's a huge challenge to summarize Kiala's long list of achievements with brevity in addition to reverently giving you an inside view on the deep loving connection that is multi-decades long between KK and I. The reality is I can't. I've pretty much failed. (laughs) However, what allows me to feel better about this is that I believe this powerful conversation, one of many more to come, with my hilarious badass always reaching for bigger homegirl for life, will give you a killer glimpse of how amazing she is and how much she means to me. Before I sign off here, I would love to ask for your support by subscribing to this podcast, giving it a five-star review and rating on iTunes, and to share this episode up on your Instagram stories, tagging both Kayala Kenley and I. She is K-E-A-L-A-K-E-N-N-E-L-L-Y in the show notes, and my Instagrams, Roxy Look and Black Belt Beauty, also in the show notes. We'd love to get some words on why and how it impacted you in that post. So without any more words, because I've shared a lot of them here, I'm so excited to let you drop in to this powerful talk with my powerful girl, Kayala Kenley. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Beauty Counter. You guys, as a beauty expert and makeup pro of over 20 years, I have legitimately sifted and sorted through endless amounts of beauty products from skincare to makeup, you name it, I've touched it. And, you know, high performance is always a priority to me. You know, when you're working on clients who are on the red carpet or accepting awards on live shows like the Oscars, things of that nature, there really is no room for error when it comes to performance. But as a total, you know, lover of health, you know, over the past decade, I became highly conscious about you know, the health aspect of products too, and really trying to steer away from skincare and makeup products that, you know, have chemicals and fragrances and ultimately health disruptors. So, When I found Beauty Counter, you guys, I started playing with their skincare and their makeup products on me. I was so happy with the results. Not only, you know, did they totally deliver, but I legitimately felt better putting these products onto my skin. You know, what you put on your skin is totally affecting your health. And it's so important to really realize that. Not to mention the brand is really health conscious for the world, and I love that too, but that's just me. So check it out. You guys can now shop my personal favorites on blackbeltbeauty.com from Beauty Counter. You just got to go to the shop section, go to beauty, and you will find my favorites. And I'm continuously adding new products there as I discover more because the brand is just constantly you know, creating new amazing skincare products and makeup products. So as I learn about them, them, and as I try them and love them, I'm sharing them on the site. So check it out. Go to blackbeltbeauty.com, go to the shop beauty section and shop the beauty counter page from there. Let me know what you think. I'd love your feedback. And if you ever have questions about beauty, you know where to find me. DM me, Roxy Look or Black Belt Beauty. Lots of love, you guys. We're recording. <laughs> Ideally, we were going to be doing this in real life on the Aina. I had a ticket booked in April, you know, to get back to Hawaii and then everything happened and still haven't rerouted that ticket. Um, but anyways, I'm so fucking excited to finally be here with my forever best friend. Um, I'm your forever friend. My forever friend. <laughs> I have so many names for you. Keala. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Dude, so one thing that how many I wonder how many times I'm gonna be like dude in this episode. Dude and yell. Bruh. Bruh. One thing that's super fun um that I want to share right off the bat is uh you know I even though we're we're at the we're like close to almost 30 years of friendship. I was trying to do the math today, but we're like 25, 26, some shit like that. Um 
Don't and add, don't add yours. <laughs> <laughs> Make us sound older than we are, Roxy. <laughs> There's really no need for that. We have no age. No, so I, you know, so one might think, oh, you know, when you're so close to somebody, podcasting, conversation, it's going to be easy, right? Um, I wouldn't say that it's hard because you're my girl, but I would say that there's so much more that goes into when you know someone so well, as well as I know you. I mean, as much life as we've lived together, it actually doesn't make it easier. It's interesting. I'm getting but- all these like flashes of like... <laughs> All, all the segments and the chapters and the oh my god, just so many scandalous and just off the wall things coming. Just, <laughs> I mean, can we just say that we're so lucky we beat social media in our years of? Oh, we are so sorry to everyone who didn't. Um, but hey, this is what I was going to say though, which was so cool. You know, so I'm like, okay, my girl has done so much in her life. Like so many incredible accomplishments that I literally had to go and research, like just go back because I mean, I, you've done so much and obviously I have been there throughout it, you know, but did you, like, did you Google me. I didn't Google you. Um, I YouTubed cause I feel like YouTube is just fucking where it's at. Um, but no, it, it, it just started to remind me of like, Oh, this and, and you know, the Eddie and I'm like, Kayla, you've done some serious shit. And the fun part is, is like, you're in a place now, which I'm so excited to talk about where it's like, man, with everything that you've already done, it's like you haven't even, you're, it's almost like you're just getting warmed up. Do you feel that way? Um, I feel that way in the sense that like, I'm going to expand outside of surfing. You know what I mean? Um, as far as, as far as like surfing goals, I've crossed so many off my list that I'm having to like set these like really unrealistic goals at this point. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> she laughs <laughs> and I see her fucking thrown over a ledge. Yeah. Well, that could be dangerous. How do you navigate around that? How do you keep yourself in the zone of, yeah, I want to keep pushing it and keep reaching these new heights. And at the same time, um, I want to make sure that I stay alive and stay, you know, and am capable to walk. Right. Yeah. Cause getting <laughs> out of bed these days is rough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see Roxy, but I have, I have like a, a, I have like a tens unit on right now as we speak. Um, oh, on my no way. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of injuries, like uh, obviously when you keep hucking yourself into um, waves the size of small buildings, your body's going to pay the price. So yeah, I can't keep doing that forever indefinitely. Um, but yeah, when it comes to like big wave surfing, what I do, I just try and calculate my risk. You know, I think I, I when I was younger, I just kind of would send, I would just send it without really thinking. I would like leap before I looked and stuff like that. And it got me in a lot of trouble. So <laughs> It did. Now, like I, you know, I've had a very long career. I've had a lot of really close calls, uh, you know, quite a few where I thought it was I was I was like, this is my outro. It sucks. I, I felt like I had more to accomplish, but I guess I'm dying now. <laughs> <laughs> Side note for everybody listening and watching, it's all I. I've said this to you so many times. It's always hilarious to me how. You were so humorous about these, the actual, like what you just said, where you're literally not kidding. Like you've literally been at the point where you're like, oh, okay, I, this literally, this is it. I'm, I'm, there's a good chance I'm not coming up after taking all these, you know, taking yeah, away I mean, from my head or whatever. I'm not happy, I'm not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just incredible that you can, you know, the, yeah, it's crazy. Anyways, back to what you were saying. So yeah, you've been in that position several times when you were a kid. Yeah, well, I've been in that position when I was younger because I would just like not really um, look before I leaped and I just wanted to send it so hard and I just kind of did not calculate my risks. Like I, I can recall the first time I went to Chopu in Tahiti and I was just so excited, you know. Um, and it's really hard to tell 
in Tahiti because Chopu is kind of like out on this outer reef. So from the beach, it's really hard to tell the size, you know, cause it's so far away. So it's like, is it two foot? Is it 20 foot? I don't know. And for those people who are watching Chopu is the wave behind you. Yes. That's yeah. mm-hmm. so, uh, so yeah, the, the first time I went and surfed Chopu, um, there was a really big swell and you know, this is pre I don't think it's pre-internet, but definitely the forecasting is not what it is now. So like, you know, now I would have known exactly how big it was supposed to be and like whatever. So, you know, we went out in a boat and when we got to the lineup, I just saw this perfect like six foot wave roll through and just barrel. And I was just like frothing. Like I could not get out of that boat fast enough and like paddle over. You know, I just, I just wanted, the waves were so beautiful. I just wanted to get one. And what I didn't know, like, had I sat a little bit longer in that boat and actually like (laughs) assessed what I would have, what I would have discovered is that wave was not even a wave that was just like a little swell that passed by and like the actual waves and the actual size was like three times that, you know? So I paddled over and I think, I think Shane Dorian, I paddled up next to Shane Dorian, who's like a supercharger and he was just like, Oh, KK ballsy out here charging and I was just like whatever it's six feet you know I'm stoked and uh, so I turned around and paddled for a wave that didn't even break and then I like turned around and just saw the entire ocean stand up you know so and, heavy yeah I was just like oh my god I'm I'm like gonna die you know mm-hmm. this is pre any kind of like flotation gear pre you know i I had a surfboard and a leash and, and board shorts and that's it. That's you know? great. Is that crazy for you to think about now? Because now there's so many, you know, tools that help you survive essentially in these life threatening situations. And like, you look back kind of like maybe how, you know, guys back in the day were, were charging Waimea with no leash. Like, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is pre anything. So like I had no, no kind of backup, no kind of, uh, Yeah. Yeah, to think about that now, because I yeah, my just having having even like the wetsuits that have the flotation sewn in, mm-hmm. like it doesn't make you that much more buoyant. But I think it's just like a, you know, it's like my spidey suit. Like I feel naked without it now, you know. So um, yeah. so yeah, so I turn around and the entire ocean was standing up and about to land on me, and I just went, God, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was ter- I was terrified, you know. And so I had like a two wave hold down, like the thing just like threw me down on the reef, which is so much force. And it just held me on the reef. I was just pinned for a two wave hold down. And, uh, I remember just like, like my life just started flashing before my eyes. And I think you and I were fighting at the time. Like we hadn't spoken. I don't, you know, of course you don't remember what you were fighting about. It was probably something really stupid, but we were like, you know, we were at odds with each other and just not communicating. And I remember just feeling so guilty about that. Like I'm going to die. And I didn't even talk to my best friend, you know? <laughs> so luckily I didn't die. I, you know, came up from that. And um, yeah. my board was like in three pieces and I just grabbed a piece of it and paddled into the channel and got in a boat and was just like shaking, you know? Um, but yeah. It's re- it it's really hard to imagine you be afraid to be honest like as your fucking girl of forever like it's crazy because for anybody who has ever surfed and has felt what it feels like to you know be held under from from a wave and and we're talking like like for me you know I'm more of like a three to four foot. And we are always going like by the, the back, right? No, not the face um, of the wave. And just like you know, all this measurement stuff. Like, yeah. <laughs> people always ask me like, what's the biggest wave you've surfed? And I'm just like, I don't fucking know. I don't like, care. See that building. <laughs> I don't carry a tape measure in my board shorts. Like no. <laughs> waves aren't even, big waves aren't even measured in feet. They're measured in increments of fear. Somebody yeah. said once, you know what I mean? And it's so true. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's hard. So I was saying like, you know, for me, for example, being pinned down at, you know, what, um, Hanalei or something, it's like on a four foot day, like it's not comfortable, right? It's pretty scary. You, all these years, like the evolution of your surfing, because as a kid and I, I'm, I'm we're going to go there, but like charging tunnels and cannons and, and like 
just, you've always been a charger, but then obviously as like years progress and your surfing career has evolved, you've just gone bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's really, really, um, going back to what I was saying, it's kind of hard to imagine you being afraid because of how gnarly you are with, you know, the, the waves that you are fucking surfing. Like it's, it's, it's there's a massive misconception about me because I get this a lot. Everybody thinks I'm fearless, right? And I'm not fearless at all. Like to be fearless is to be ignorant of the consequences, right? I am well aware of the consequences. Um, I just try and calculate my risk. And then, you know, there's just something so empowering about feeling the fear and then standing up to it and overcoming it. Like that feeling is so empowering. Like that's actually what I'm addicted to. You know, like I'm addicted to the rush of riding waves and everything, but really it's, it's overcoming that fear. You know, everything that you want is on the other side of fear. That's fucking badass. Um, it takes I mean, it me. Feel, it wouldn't feel nearly as amazing if you didn't feel that fear. Like I feel that fear every time I pedal out big surf, every single time I feel it, you know? Did you feel that as a kid when you first started you know, I mean, you're surfing, yes, pine trees, you know, and uh, beach breaks and whatnot. But like when you were charging tunnels and cannon and you're surfing, and for those who don't know, I mean, these are places where the waves are hollow, there's sharp reef, it's shallow. So there's serious consequence to, to fucking up out there. But yeah. you're out there like with your little cute, Kel is the cutest baby, FYI, like your baby bitch. <laughs> She's like this howly white girl, uh, you know, so tan, so tan. <laughs> bleach blonde hair, you know, North Shore Kauai and just, you know, out there charging with the boys. Did you feel, I mean, obviously you're too young and you're not going to be conscious of like, oh, I feel so empowered. But was that part of what kept you excited and wanting to surf more and more back then? Can you kind of now look back and go, I felt that without even realizing it back then? I think that I just, um, I always gravitated towards sports and physical, like doing physical things. You know what I mean? I'm just a very physical person. And, uh, and then I just, I grew up with a lot of boys and I just wanted to do whatever the boys were doing. Uh, and, and then I found that I found that I had like these talents when it came to like physicality, when it came to sports. And so that made me feel really good. Like that gave me, you know, a sense of purpose. It gave me self-confidence, you know? Um, yeah. So I think that's. So that just kept you. So, okay, cool. Let's, I want to hang out on Kauai with young Kayla for a minute. Cause there's a lot there that really, you know, ch- shaped the rest of your life, right. That really impacted you as an, a woman as an individual, a human, and then also obviously shaped what would become your career and, you know, has led you to be where you are now. But, you know, just kind of pulling on those strings a bit, you know, you're a female, like a, a cute white girl, Howley girls was say in Hawaii, you know, and you're born and raised North Shore Kauai, um, you know, pretty much more, you know, your activities were more male dominant at that time, right? I mean, Surfing back. <laughs> What'd you say? Still are. <laughs> Still are. Have well, you seen, listen. Have you seen the shed I built during quarantine? <laughs> oh, we're I wanted to we're gonna talk about that. I you know, the thing is is like, okay, so when I started surfing, I was 17. When I became a surfer, it was really like 18, 19. And even then when I was surfing, it wasn't like there were that many girls in the water, right? Blue crush which for those of you who haven't seen, you know, Kael is the shit in the movie that Kate Bosworth is like, oh my God, it's Kael. Um, you know, after that movie, it's there's more girls in the water than than guys oftentimes, right? So well, here's the thing. I think that, uh, I think that for a lot of girls, they need to see another female do something before they realize that they can do it. Mm-hmm. And I just never looked at life like that. I just needed to see a human do it. And then I, you know, I didn't need to see a female do it. That's, I think, why I've been able to 
pioneer and be a first at all these things. I wasn't waiting for another female to like show me that it was possible. I just needed to see like the guys do it. And it was like, okay, well, if they can do it, I'm going to see if I can do it, you know? So do you think that in part, I'm curious because you didn't necessarily see yourself as I'm a girl or I'm, you know what I mean? Like, were you just like, I'm Kiala, if this is possible. Oh, look, he's doing it. So why can't I do it? Kind of thing. No, it was even like deeper than that rocks. It was like, um, I thought, I thought I was, I didn't know the difference between boys and girls. I just thought I was one of the boys. There was literally like no girls in my neighborhood. So I was just like, like I, I understood I had different body parts, but I just didn't understand like what that meant. Like socially, you know, like it in life, what that meant. Okay. And so when I was about probably about six years old, I want to say, I became cognizant of the fact that there was like a difference between boys and girls. And the major difference was how people viewed what boys and girls could and couldn't do, you know? And so when I started being told like I was a girl, it was usually with like these negative connotations of like, oh, you can't play tackle football because you're a girl or you can't surf because you're a girl. You can't, you know, play sport. And so it was just like, God, being a girl really sucks. All I hear is like what I can't do, you know? And so I was really, um, I was really kind of devastated that I was a girl. I just felt like I got the real shit end of the stick in life, you know? And um, (laughs) I was really depressed. And I think my mom actually like saw, I was really struggling with, with this whole girl thing. And and, uh, she was like, I think she was trying to cheer me up she, she was like, Oh, Kelly, you know, there's, there's this one thing that girls can do that boys can't. And I was just like, so excited to hear what this was. Cause all I was hearing was all these things I couldn't do. So I was just like, so excited to hear this, like, Oh my God, do I have like a superpower? Do you know, can I fuck like, can I fly or shoot laser? Like what? Oh my God, what is it? And she was like, well, you can have a baby. And that was like the worst thing my mother could have said. Like that just sounded like the ultimate punishment to me. Like I literally just started sobbing. And at six years old, I really, that was, that was the first time in my life I contemplated suicide because it was like, I want to, I, I, I just want to die. Like, this is awful. I've been cursed in life and I I just want to die. And I hope that like, I just had, I had this whole thought in my head as, as a six year old, like, well, if I kill myself and there's reincarnation, I could come back as a boy and then I can do all these things that I want to do in life, you know? But then I had like another thought as a six year old, I had to like, had to like process through this. Right. Uh, okay. But what if you die, you don't come back. Like, what if this is my only chance at life? So maybe I, I probably shouldn't kill myself because this might be my one shot. So it was like kind of right then and there I decided, okay. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to let all these people put these restrictions on me because I'm a female. And so it was kind of, I kind of just made this decision at six that that's that's a big deal at six. Yeah. I was just like, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. I don't care what anybody says. And okay. You know what that made me flash to? (laughs) It made me flash to this, um, image in this magazine where I saw you surfing, you know, I'm this teenage on Kauai and I'm, you know, so into it. Right. And, and there's this magazine where there's a shot of you surfing. You always have this aggressive look on your face. Um, I mean, and granted you were always doing something aggressive, you know, in the, in the photo surfing, you know, like smashing the lip or like doing it. And I, I just fucking loved it, you know, and I, this is before we met and, you know, and, and, and I knew you. Yeah. So it's like, um, I just, I love that aggression. And so it's funny because when you say that, you know, that that's, you made up your mind, it makes me immediately think of what kind of translates into your surfing. It's just like, I'm fucking, this is who I am. This is what I'm going for. Fucking no limits. Like watch me do this. That's, that's what it felt, you know, to look from the outside, which is why, you know, (laughs) this could, it'll, which is why when, you know, we got to, when we, when we met, you know, and I'm like, we're surfing clear as day can remember the moment in my mind 
And, uh, you know, and I, and I was aware like Kiala is home. Cause at that time, you know, uh, me and your brothers had become friends, right. I hadn't met you yet. And, you know, it's like, Oh, Kiala's in the water. Cause you weren't living on quiet at the time. And then, you know, you, 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 you're there in the water and it was such a fun day of surfing too, or from our favorite spots. And I remember, uh, looking at you and I just like can see it right now, your smile, like your, when Kiala smiles, her eyes smile. Right. And so I just saw these, huh? Smizing. Smizing. <laughs> Your smile, your eyes were smiling and you were so sweet. And it's so funny because, you know, here's the girl that, you know, when I see pictures of her, she's always got this aggressive look on her face, badass. And now she's just the sweetest looking girl, just smiling at me like, hi, can we be friends kind of thing? Like that was your eyes, you know? Massive misconception about me. Like number one, misconception, people think I'm fearless. Number two, misconception. People think I'm this really freaking gnarly bitch that's going to tear your face off. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they just think I'm this aggressive, like, beast that, you know, I've had some of my best friends, you know, just be like, I was so intimidated when I met you. Like, you know, you as well. We're just like, yeah. Well, I wasn't intimidated. I was more, like, surprised and you know, our, our smiles were in full agreement with each other. I was like, (laughs) (laughs) cause we literally were attached to the hip after that for forever, you know, for years and years. But, um, yeah, I can see how people could, you know, get that misconception in you because, you know, there is something really interesting about Keala in the water versus Keala on land. Even Keala on land has like a really gnarly resting bitch face. (laughs) Yeah, but you're so, but it's like, yeah, but the minute somebody talks to you, you're hilarious, you're funny, you find a way, you always have a good way to make people feel good about themselves, to make them laugh. You're so generous, you know, so it's like, maybe, maybe, you know, you're resting bitch face, but dude, no, the minute somebody literally starts talking to you, like that's a wrap on that, you know, idea (laughs) about what you, you know whatever. But, um, Kauai, you know, growing up on Kauai as a young girl, I mean that, you know, there were so, there's so many things we can kind of point at to that have helped you basically to become the woman that you are, you know, all specifically even the challenges. Right. And then obviously there's a lot of things. Um, it's not to say that the Island is just more of your environment, your home life, all of that stuff as a child that really, you know, played a big role, um, you know, in terms of a lot of things that you've had to conquer, um, and develop and work through in your life that have affected your career life. And then just Kiala in general. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I've, there's there at every turn of my life, there's just, it's been a struggle. There's been so many things to overcome. I mean, everything from like that, what I described at six years old of like coming to grips that I'm a female in a man's world, you know? Um, And then also growing up in Hawaii, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but it's like, it's really like reverse racism there, you know, like um, we're, we're all living through the black lives matter movement. um, And I definitely did not have to worry about cops killing me as a child, but I did have to worry about local kids wanting to pound my face in all the time, you know, just cause I was white. So real thing. It's, it's, that's real. Uh, you know, and then I was a tomboy, uh, which, you know, I think was probably most disappointing for my mom. Cause she wanted a little girl so bad. Like she had two sons and like, you know, when she had me, she basically had like a third boy, I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but people kind of frowned on that as well, you know, cause I was like a girl, but I was not feminine. And then you know, it was like, I also knew I might be a lesbian. That was another thing that was like super frowned upon. So it was just like, I felt like, I felt like, I I feel like I've had to fight so hard just to like exist in the world as I am, you know? And do you feel from where you are now that the fight has serviced you on a high level or do you feel it's made me, it's made me so resilient. You know, it's I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. If there's one thing that we 
we know about Keala that I definitely know about Keala is bitch just keeps getting back up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you can't. Even when you, she, should, even when she should just take five KK. <laughs> Whether it's like under the wave or just, you know, like the transition of career happenings or, you know, all of, you know, there's, you just, you don't. And what I love so much, KK, is that you don't just get back up, but you get back up and you punch back. Mm -hmm. And you always, you, you always have found a way to continuously thrive from that get back up business, you know, which is, which is so dope. So like, if we think about, I mean, okay, listen, for a, a huge part of your surfing career life, for your life, you're chasing the world title. I think you're 25 or something where you got se- like second, where you came in. Was that right? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to age 2003 came so close, just slipped through my fingers. That was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> I just got a flash of no title. <laughs> This is bound to happen. Like things are going to swarm in as we're talking because we can't. Uh, <laughs> like, I can literally remember we're getting the car, no title. <laughs> the CD player, no title. Yeah. Oh I'm- my gosh. But like, wait, okay. So here we are, you know, which is, for those who don't know, I mean, to get to that position to be in the race for the title, you, you're traveling around the world. You're competing at the highest level against the best in the world. You get to this place. This is up to your, that point in your life. It's your lifelong dream. And now, you know, you, you, it, like you said, it slipped through your fingers. Like how, how did you fucking process that to get back up and keep going and then thrive? Uh, I think that when it slipped through my fingers, I think I came back the next year just really angry and just wanting to win so bad. And then I kind of, I don't know, it was just so devastating to me that I didn't win that title. Um, and then I just kind of lost my competitive fire after that, you know? Um, <clears throat> and that's when I kind of decided to, to step away from the tour. You know, I was kind of dealing with a lot of injuries as well. And my rate, my ranking started slipping and also, they started canceling a lot of the events that I really um, excelled in, mm-hmm. you know. I was really hard to beat uh, at places like Tahiti, places like Fiji, you know. Once the waves were bigger and more powerful, I felt like I was I was really – that's when I really shined. That's when my special talents came through, and, and I was really, really hard to beat. And then I had, like, my weaknesses, which were small, grovelly waves, you know, beach breaks – and so when they started get re- getting rid of the events that I really excelled in and replacing them with more small grovelly beach breaks, which were kind of my Achilles heel, mm-hmm. I was just kind of like, God, my special talents are going to waste here. You know, um, I don't feel like I can win that world title I want to in, in, in these circumstances. And I, you know, I don't want to just like be mediocre and be like somewhere in the top 10. Like I want to be the best in the world at something. And so I feel like I have these special talents and I feel like I could be the best at riding these kind of waves. And so that's kind of when I started looking elsewhere to, to do something where I felt like I was fulfilling my purpose. You know, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was fulfilling my purpose on tour at that point. I just felt like I was kind of complacent. Getting what, what's dope about that too, um, to hear you say it is like, man, so what you didn't do is say, okay, I'm going to step down from, you know, where, where I know I thrive and my talents and really what fuels me, like you said, your purpose, right? Um, to try and fit in this box to maybe like kind of play the game so that maybe I can win, right? You're like, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, step away. And at the time, like there wasn't a big wave. People looked at that like career suicide. I actually stepped away and did a TV series as an actor for a year, which a lot of people don't know, but even just to step away from the tour was career suicide. I was requalified for the next year and just gave up my spot. And everybody's just like, what are you doing? You know, but not only was I feeling, not only was I fighting against not fulfilling my purpose and feeling like you know, my talents were going to waste, but I was also fighting against, I had this internal battle of, I'd been a closeted lesbian on tour 
And so like hiding who I was, like, I felt like I had changed so much myself to fit. You said that box to fit into that box. I'm having to change my surfing. Um, I'm having to change like who I am at my core, like my sexual identity, you know? Uh, and so it was just like, all of these things were just like weighing so heavy on me, you know, that I, I felt like I was dying. And you, and you pushed through. And you still yeah. chose, <laughs> this is, you know, you still chose, no, I'm going to gamble. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to go do this, you know, TV show. Was it HBO? John Stockwell, you know. Uh, it was uh, David Milch, John from Cincinnati. Okay, John from right. It's, it's crazy. Girl, you have done so much. Like, it's no, it's, crazy. Super weird. it's really <laughs> weird, though. Like, it's so weird. No, because there's just so weird. much. Yeah, and all these random weird things apart from my surfing career you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely. Um, one might not connect like, Oh, the TV show, but at the same time you were in blue crush at that point. And that was a big I've done a couple little things too. I done cameos and other things, you know, I've, I've had like, I've had like some acting jobs. It's super weird. Had, yeah. No, because you're a character girl. <laughs> <laughs> you're a character, you know, there's a lot of energy, you know, people like, People, some people just stand out and they have an essence about them, you know? And when you meet Kayala, and I know I'm your girl, so it could be, you know, sure, I'll be a little biased here. But I'm also someone who's lived around the world, who has met a shit ton of people for so many reasons, career, whatever. Some people just have an essence about them that just makes you want to know more, you know? And, and um, yeah, I think that that has really been so obvious with you and and has allowed you to, you know, call in these other opportunities that might seem so separate from, you know, surfing or in fact are, but at the same time, it's like, it seems separate, but if you like break it down though, it's all performance based and it's all performance under pressure. Right. Mm -hmm. So like surfing is performance based. You're being judged, you know, you're, uh, you're having to perform, you know, people are going to be watching you and, and, you know, uh, you, there's a time limit. And so there's all this pressure and it's performance pressure. Like when I DJ, same thing, like there's an audience watching you one wrong move, you push the wrong button, you know, the record scratches or like the music cuts, everybody's going to be staring at you. Like you fucked up, you know, yeah. and acting as well. You've like, you know, people who like see you on the screen with like one other actor, but like, if you could see the whole picture, you're in, uh, you know, on a set with like so many people and they're all watching you. And you're having to perform. So, you know, it's, they seem very separate, but if you, if you look at the, the one common denominator, right, it's performance is performing. It's performing under pressure and doing well. Yeah. You know, you just made me flash to your Ted talk in Malibu. And I remember, you know, it's like, it's crazy. And you know, now you're, you're a speaker and you're out there and you're, you know, traveling the world. I mean, obviously right now we're a little weird place, but like prior to the quarantine and everything, like you're, you know, being flown to Japan and being asked to speak in front of, you know, hundreds of people. Right. And it's like, people, yeah. Another, yeah. another <laughs> super performance under pressure thing. Super pre- in yeah. Japan, my, the power went out on my laptop and my slide deck disappeared. And I was just like, freaking. <laughs> like lost in the woods. So, okay. So this is awesome because, you know, everyone who's listening, I, you know, in my community and I know people who follow you or, you know, dialed into this, you know, um, you know, passion of, of just performing well in life. And, and, uh, you know, in my life, it's like, I don't know if you've seen the, the Michael Jordan documentary. Um, you know, I fucking love Jordan. Um, the last dance. It's so good. Um, I already love him, but then you watch this documentary and I'm like, Oh my God, I just, I'm really interested in performing with excellence, you know, and just always kind of striving for the best out of me. Right. Which means I'm going to put myself in positions where there's a lot of fucking pressure. Right. And so I would love for you because like you said, that through line in your life with all of these experiences and these opportunities is Kayla performing under pressure. Um, you know what, if you could offer one to three powerful mindset tips that can help one maneuver through 
the, and they're all different. I know it's different being held under a wave versus, you know, the thing goes out in Japan and you're talking to people, mm-hmm. but just a couple of tips that could support. Cause when you're in that position, how are you getting through it? Okay. So one of my first tips like that I try and that I've lived by is, uh, never set limitations, never set limitations for yourself based on the opinions of other people. Cause most of them are going to tell you that you can't. And a lot of times they're telling, they're telling you that you can't because they don't feel like they can. And why should you be able to, especially like, you know, got like surfer guys will look at me and I'm like half their size. And it's just like, well, how can she go ride those big waves? If she's just like this, you know, tiny, th- I should be able to do it and I can't do it. So she shouldn't, you know, she shouldn't be able to do it. And then the ones that can do it don't really want the competition. Right. So just never listen to other people tell you that you can't do something. If I would have listened to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that told me I couldn't do something, I wouldn't have accomplished even half of the things I have in my career. So that's number one, you know? Um, Number two, I would say you just, you never know how truly strong you are until you're put in certain positions. So like as gnarly as some of those wipeouts and hold downs that I've had have been, they've taught me how strong I am because I've literally been put in situations where I'm like, there's no way I'm going to survive this. There's no way I'm going to survive this. And then when you do, you just are like, wow, like I'm even stronger than I actually thought I was. Not that I ever want to go through that again, (laughs) but you know that you are able to survive it. Like, you know, and there, and that gives you a confidence, you know, yeah. it also gives you nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. That makes me think of picking you up at the airport after Tahiti that one time we'll go there, but keep going. Sorry. Fuck. No, I think that's all I have for you right now. No, that's, I mean, listen, those were home runs. Those are amazing. They're so helpful. And what I love about them is that they're so applicable. You know, it's like we, they're, they're so universal and they're so applicable. Um, and obviously they're working because you keep, you keep going for bigger. So, you know, <laughs> you step away from that part of tour life. You're dealing with, you know, personal battles of coming out and then you say, fuck it. And you start going, hi, this is who I am. This is who I am. This I'm, a who lesbian. I am. I'm a lesbian. I am a tomboy. And I like to surf big gnarly waves and that's, I'm, I'm going to finally live, live my truth. And do you that think that very, it was very freeing and empowering feeling? However, <laughs> well, no, however, keep going because, you know, it's hard for me to go back and remember, you know, what, well, well now it's starting to come to me because I'm thinking about how people reacted to you in your surfing career and, you know, the battles that you perhaps had to go through from that, but also the encouragement. And like, I think, I feel like you had, there was just this, uh, it was like a blend of both where it was like, there was a lot of fuck yeah, KK. Mm -hmm. And then even from like surprising territories, right? Like the boys and all. And then there was some interesting pieces, you know, when it comes to sponsorship and things like that. You can elaborate. Like navigating that, the, like the tour and the industry and the sponsors as a closeted homosexual, which is so gnarly. Even before I got on the tour, because I, I, gradu- I literally graduated high school a year ahead of my class. I was 16 years old when I graduated high school. Um, and right before my 17th birthday, I started competing on a pro level and, and trying to get on tour and qualifying. And so I had already heard these like cautionary tales even before I got on tour that like there was lesbians on tour. You really need to steer clear from these lesbians. You do not want to be associated with them. And you definitely don't want to be a lesbian because, you know, you're you're not going to have any, you're not going to have any sponsors. Like basically you're, you can't have a, a successful professional serving career if you know, you're a lesbian. So like, at that point, I hadn't hooked up with a boy or a girl yet, you know, but I kind of like on a deep level knew I liked girls, but just like didn't even want to admit that to myself because it was just like, no, like, like pro surfing is my dream since I was a little kid. And I just like this, if this is how I have to be to, to like reach this childhood dream, then, you know, this is who I'll be. And 
yeah, so I wasn't even admitting it to myself at that point. And I just remember getting on tour and just being terrified. You know, I immediately went out and got a boyfriend. Um, but I just felt like as soon as you, as soon as you were on tour, you're just under this microscope, you know, that you, it was just this witch hunt to figure out what your sexuality was, sexuality was, because I felt like lesbian was such a derogatory term for a female athlete. And I've tried to like wrap my head around why that's such a derogatory term. And what I've kind of landed on is. I feel like the male athletes, if they could somehow prove or call you a lesbian, it diminished your talent because it was like, you were just trying to be like a man anyway. So like if you were straight and feminine, like that was like valued. But like, if you were a lesbian, it was, it just kind of dismissed your not your ability and your, your athleticism. Almost like, like, oh, you know, if you were a femme, a femme girl and you're charging Chopo, it's like, oh, now that's crazy. But if you're I'm just trying to paint the picture from what you just said. But if you're a lesbian, if you're gay and then you're charging Chopo, you're it's like almost like masculine. if you're like more masculine, it makes yeah. more sense. it makes more sense. Right. Right. So interesting. Yeah, that that had been really fucking difficult to it's maneuver hard. through, especially at such a young age, you know? Yeah. And then I had like, you know, so everybody was trying to figure out like if I was a lesbian, that was just a constant stressor and a constant fear. And I was really like living this double life, as you know, cause you were a part of that double life where I would yeah. be on tour, just very, you know, trying to act very straight, trying to act, you know, feminine, trying to play up the feminineness, even though that would just was so against my nature, mm-hmm. you know, I was just like, pretending to be this person that I thought the tour and the industry wanted and needed me to be. Mm-hmm. And as soon as like the contest would be over, it's like, okay, where's Roxy? I'm flying to New York. Like we're partying. I need to blow off some steam. I'm going to like be super gay in public. And this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Love New York. for that. <laughs> Just I felt so freedom, free. like <laughs> I felt so free, you know, and then I would come to the tour and it was just this confined, like constrictive place. And so I was just like, existing in these two worlds and it was like really hard you know um so when you broke free though and you you know for like just to you know really talk about that for a second of just you know the 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 part where you were like fuck it i'm gonna live my life i mean we we had that at six but obviously with a, we had a we had a uh, reincarnation of that we had a reincarnation like exactly you know an act of that because i wasn't I wasn't living my truth. Yeah. I wasn't living my life the way I wanted to. Like I promised myself I would when I was six, I was conforming yeah. and I was pretending to be something I was not. And I was being disingenuous. And like, I, if you know me, I'm just like such an honest, authentic person. Mm-hmm. So to be living this lie just was weighing so heavy on my soul, you know? So like I had a lot of suicidal thoughts when I, you know, during that time. Yeah. It was just, yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of pressure. Um, it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of pain. You know, and and yet pain is. Like I just felt so. I felt so unaccepted in the world. You know what I mean? Yes. Even from my young age, I just felt so ostracized as a child for so many reasons. And then, you know, when I got on tour and I just had to like pretend to be something I was not to fit in, I just. I just felt like I just did not belong in this world. And so there was a lot of pain. There was a lot of loneliness. Oh yeah. They, yeah. I can see that. Well, and pain is, I was going to say when you flip it though, it, it, it really is such a powerful catalyst for growth, you know? So like when we are a powerful catalyst for performance, you know, because I pushed a lot, I pushed a lot of that pain down you know? Um, and I, you know, something that a lot of people know about me. I mean, I, I've gotten definitely more vocal about it uh, on my social media stuff, but I, I got diagnosed with bipolar about two years ago. Mm-hmm. And so, we, you know, we have, we, we, when we have good feelings, those are amplified. When we have bad feelings, those are amplified. So the pain and the, like the anger and the rage, like super amplified in me. And I, I needed somewhere to go with it you know, and it was not something I ever wanted to unleash on other people, Mm -hmm. but I had this inside of me. I had these, 
these really complicated, dark feelings inside of me. And I call it my dark rage. And so when people like ask, like, you know, how are you able to just like aggressively attack those big waves? It's like, I'm releasing my dark rage. I've been saving this up. See, <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she laughs. God. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla, you're fucking special, man. Dude, dark rage sounds awesome. Yeah, it's very, like, powerful. It's very like, powerful. It's very powerful. It really is. Pain can just, you know, pain and like, you know, all that stuff. It, it can really, um, it can completely discourage you and, and derail you. Or you can just, you can find a way to transcend it and use it. Um, so yeah, I, well, you can become the victim of it. Or you can, you know, when you, when you were saying like about surfing big waves, standing up, like facing your fear and doing what you do is literally the most empowering feeling ever. And that's what you're addicted to. Mm. Well, you know what coming out is, was you facing your, it, it was like a wave that you're paddling and you're throwing yourself over because it's fucking scary, yeah. you know, I'm dealing with being bipolar and the feelings and the, all the things that come with that and then still facing it and using it even like you just said. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to be uh, vocal about my bipolar, you know, cause there's such a stigma attached to it, you know? So it was one of those things. I, I almost feel like my bo- bipolar is like my second coming out, you know, <laughs> it's like I had to come out as gay and like all the complications that came with that and facing that fear. Yeah. Uh, and now you know, coming out of somebody with a mental illness, you know, and that fear. Yeah. But I know as a public figure, mm-hmm. how many people that's going to help, you yeah. know, to be vocal about that stuff. I know coming out as a public figure is, as a lesbian, how many people that has helped, you know, and there's a part of me that almost wishes I could have come out sooner. Like, especially when I was on the CT tour, cause I kind of waited to like, I kind of didn't come out on the, world championship tour until like my last year or two, I started bringing a girlfriend around and introducing her as my girlfriend instead of like my friend, you know, mm-hmm. it was like all big like shit on tour. But yeah. you know, I kind of wish I could have come out sooner when I was still visible on the CT because I could have helped LGBT people and LGBT rights and, and, you know, young people struggling with their sexual identity sooner. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I got to benefit from straight privilege for a couple more years. Like Like, straight privilege was awesome. I used to get checks in the mail from sponsors. Like that all dried up the minute I came out, you know? So I got to milk that straight privilege. No. So it's like, you know, I was very like, oh, you know, I could have helped some more people, but oh man, I got to, got to cash a couple more checks. <laughs> Girl, you, <laughs> the thing is, Kayla, you've been leading the way your entire life. So when we think about, you know, um, like even just focusing on, you know, how, women's pay and surfing, like back when you were on the CT tour, the championship tour, um, I mean, the pay difference between oh my know, god well, like, yeah insane. go it's insane no. <laughs> i actually like dug up a picture like i found an old picture um recently of me winning the u.s open oh, uh, you have the check and i have the check <laughs> and it's for five thousand dollars and it's like now the like the women make 100k yeah the same yeah. but it's so important to say this piece that like men I'm saying it, Kiala, you were shot like the girls, the, the women of your time, like you, you led the way for that. Yeah. Well, when, I'm cashing, to, mm-hmm. when I'm cashing that $5,000 check, I'm sure the male prize for the same event was probably like closer to 50 grand. Totally. Know? And now the, the, now today the checks are a hundred grand and a hundred grand. So that's how far that's yeah. come. That's, and you've I'm, been I'm a big part of that. So that's something I'm really proud of. It is. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> I mean, that's a big, that's a big, that's a big, um, contribution. Mm-hmm. And there's so much impact in that, you know, cause going back to what you were saying in the beginning, it's like, man, you know, and I think this goes across the board. There's a whole concept like around the four minute mile. Like the minute we saw that it was possible, people started hitting the four minute mile. Right. So, you know, specifically with you, you know, where you were saying women, a lot, a lot of women may 
approach something like I haven't seen another woman do before. So is it possible? So, you know, which totally makes sense considering, you know, oppression, female oppression for hundreds of it just pissed me off that like, (laughs) you know, people were telling me I couldn't do something solely based on my gender, you know? It's like, you're not in my body, bro. You don't know like how powerful my head is. You don't know like what's in my heart. Like you don't know my t- tenacity and my relentlessness. Like I have, st- I have, you're taking me in on like a, you know, one dimensional level. Like I have stuff that you can't see on, on the surface, you know, like I have, I have a fire inside of me that you can't see, you know? And so it just used to piss me off so much when people would say like, you can't do that because you're a woman. And it's like, well, how do you know, you know, has, right. has a woman even tried to do that? Or like, you know, have, has every woman tried? Because maybe that woman that tried and failed, you know, didn't, doesn't have what I have. Like, I just, <clears throat> I always say my haters are my best motivators because they're the ones that have really lit a fire on me. All those people telling me like, you can't do that because you're a woman and, you know, just constantly putting me down. I just, I'm such a stubborn bitch that like, I, just, <laughs> I really just wanted to prove them wrong. You know, I just hated that they were saying this to me and I just really wanted to prove them wrong. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could. So, but yeah, thank you haters. <laughs> I mean, that's a common theme and a lot of, Thanks, know, when, we, when we hear no, my dark rage, you hate yeah, it. <laughs> your dark rage. day in the life right now of Keala, you know, I mean, listen, okay. So there's so many things floating through my mind right now. Like I'm thinking about Eddie I cow right now. Like when we think about, you know, being, um, someone who has been leading the way throughout your whole life, you know, coming out, you know, I mean, there were other women, obviously, who were on the tour who were out with yeah, the sexuality. There, there was world champions that uh, were definitely gay, but but you know. I feel like when you came out and you you know there was a sh- bigger shift in that direction. There was a more of an an acceptance, and I don't know if that's just me because I'm your girl and we're so close, but I I really do remember. Um, things and maybe as a society too we started to kind of open up more but it felt like there was more of a movement in that area and then you just kept going and then you know with it every and and then also like simultaneously what was happening in your life you know the big wave surfing now you know there was no big wave tour yet for women that develops for fast forward you know fucking first woman to be invited to Eddie I Cow. (laughs) <laughs> that was a shock, you know, uh, people, right. That was, that was a question, right? You were the first, I mean, I know that yeah. there was no one before you, but you, yeah, was the first. Yeah. which is a huge deal for people who don't know, like that is one of the most prestigious big wave competitions of, I don't know how long, like f- how many actual years, but you know, it takes place in Hawaii, Waimea Bay, um, never had women, you know, I know I'm jumping around a lot. A child. And like, you know, the Eddie was such a big deal. Like if you grew up in Hawaii, like, you know what the Eddie is. Like you had the sticker on your car. Eddie would go. Yeah. Right. So it was just like super ingrained in Hawaiian culture. And, you know, people would wake up four o'clock in the morning to go to a spot on the beach to watch the Eddie and the traffic would be like ridiculous. Uh, so everybody knows what the Eddie is. And I remember being a, a little kid and just going like, again, it was that, you know, time in my life where I was around six years old, where I was just trying to wrap my head around all the things that I wasn't supposed to be doing or couldn't do because I was a female. And that was one, definitely one of them of like, Oh, you know, I'll never be able to um, surf in the eddy cause I'm a girl, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the same way. Like I'll never be able to go to Kamehameha high school cause I'm not Hawaiian, you know, <laughs> Hawaiians are laughing right now. I never made, I never made it to Cam High School, but um, <laughs> I, did make it in the Eddie, though. I did make it in the Eddie, though. You sure did, dude. That's crazy. It's so nuts. Um, and then I want to talk about too, like just to stay on the theme of you know, um, you know, leading the way essentially, performing at high level. Let's talk about now. There's a big wave tour for women. You know. Yeah, when I started. When I quit the the WCG tour and just started charging big waves, 
uh, it, I mean, it was just like a passion project. Like I was still getting paid a little bit of money from my sponsor Billabong, but I'd lost when I came out as gay and the economy, you know, it coincided with the economy, just taking a super nosedive, you know? Yeah. I remember that. So that was all very bad timing, but I lost like all of my sponsors, Billabong cut my salary in half. And, um, but I was still getting paid enough where I could like get to a couple swells and like, you know, go, go ride these big waves. And, um, and, but the, you know, there really wasn't any other females doing this at the time, you know? Um, and there definitely wasn't a way to make money doing it. You know, um, I was just kind of maxing out my credit cards to get to these swells, <laughs> you know, because I just felt like this is, this is my talent. This is what I'm good at. And I'm just going to find a way to make money doing this, you know? And we know, I'm going to insert this. Yeah, please do. We know that <laughs> we know that at that time, it was such a critical moment. I so remember that period. It was a big deal. Uh, the challenges that you were facing in that time, you know, the transitions, the sponsorships and all that. And you were even getting advice of like, maybe you should, you know, open a restaurant or not like that's a bad idea, but like basically you were getting ideas like, Hey, maybe you should accept that surfing is not going to be your career life anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But going back to where you just were, you were like, I'm going to fucking find a way. I'm going to find a way. I mean, I put myself in so much debt. Like I maxed it, you know, maxed out every credit card to, to get to swells. And, and, you know, it, it's funny. Cause like at the time, the only way to make money, big wave surfing for females was like the XXL awards had a female performance award mm-hmm. and it was $5,000. So you're like, <laughs> so you spend an, you know, then they base it on like a, your performance for a year, you know, kind of like Oscars or SAG awards or whatever. And so in order to win that, like you got to chase all these swells around the world. So you're spending like 20 K 30 K a year uh, in travel to win 5,000, like the mathematics on that, you know, I went to Hawaii public high school, but I can still do the math on that one. And it just doesn't, I mean, it just doesn't work. It does. It's not in your favor. That's bad math, That's bad math right there. <laughs> you know, it's cool though. I want to reframe this. Um, because you can look at it and, and, and this is totally correct. I put myself in a lot of debt to, to move forward, um, with, with my, you know, mission to find a way you could also flip it and say, I chose to invest in myself. Any business, any business needs money to be invested. Exactly. So you, you, you at the face of uncertainty and really hard times, could be similar to now. I mean, it's, we're in an unprecedented time, but you know, back then for you, it's like, this was new territory. You had no, you had nothing else to compare it to. And you're like, fuck it. I'm going to find a way. So you, you put yourself in debt, but also we can say that you invested in yourself. And there's something really powerful about that piece that I want to pull on because this is like, this is saying, I love this. I feel like this is part of my purpose. This is who I am. And I'm going to bet on myself. Fuck it. I'm betting on myself. People ask me like, you know, Oh, when you're riding those big waves, like what's in your head. And I'm just like, well, usually like the last thing I think before I drop into one of those huge waves is, well, fuck it. And you know, Roxy, like you say, investing yourself, like I was, I was throwing on my credit card to go chase these swells. And like, yeah. the way I looked at it, it is I'm either just going to get the bomb of my life and that's going to like springboard my career where I want it to go, or I'm going to fucking die. And then I don't have to pay the credit card. So, it's, you know, <laughs> that's pretty incredible. Actually, it, it takes me to my morning. Cause I, I had, a, you know, when we started the podcast, I was like, girl, how are you? And you're like, I'm. I'm like, okay, I'm going to just start this podcast because I feel like, because to be total transparent today, um, hormones are just like mm. beat me up, you know? And I, I'm just like, I was in this, you know, like aggro mood, which sometimes like I love, it's like my dark rage. We'll just say that. Like it's my fucking spice and I love it and I use it and I was deadlifting, but I was thinking <laughs> <about deadlift. laughs> it was like, I use it, you know? Fucking deadlifting. <laughs> But I remember in the, you know, cause I'm, you know, you know what I've got, I'm building this, you know, my brand, there's so many layers to what I'm doing here. And I'm always looking at the Mount Everest, right. 
in front of me. And, uh, you know, I literally said to myself in the garage, like, I'm fucking winning or I'm dying before it happens. I'm dying trying. And that's a beautiful life because at least I'm living every single day the life. Exactly. Purpose. So that really helped you to just keep charging through, taking risks and moving forward, which would then, you know, now it's, I mean, listen, now you have a title, a big wave world champion fucking title as Keala Kenley, all of Keala. Authentically me. Yeah. Had I won the world title in 2003, I would not be my authentic self accepting that award. You know, I would have been, you know, the made up version of myself to please everybody else. And so I I almost feel like uh, it was for a reason. I didn't win the title in 2003, you know, Cause you feel like it's more meaningful. It's more meaningful to, to be able to, um, yeah, to, to reach that goal, to win that world championship as myself, unapologetically myself. Can you, I want to actually, I feel like there's an offering here somewhere that we can give to to our (laughs) listeners. I'm like, I feel it. It's like, you know, because you think like something that I always express is like the power of authenticity, you know, and authenticity is actually a word that has a lot of layers to it. So I'm going to keep this simple um, because sometimes authenticity can actually keep someone smaller and I'm not going to go there because that'll take us down a psychology rabbit hole, but I do love that piece too. But just in general, it's this idea where I'm, what we're talking about here is like just so fully being who you are, you know, who you really are, like your truth, what res, like your, what you value, what you believe, what you, who you fucking see yourself to be. Um, and doing it unapologetically, like you said, like, like it or not, this is who I am, take it or leave it. And I feel for me personally, I know in my life, like I've always somehow managed to work that part of me with no fucking problem. And I don't know if it's because (laughs) (laughs) you've always been unapologetically yourself though, since I met you, like, you know what I mean? I think I, 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 I I wonder, I, I feel like, you know, is it like one part you just come downloaded this way, but is it also so hard to get an apology out of you? (laughs) I think the thing is facing, you know, like childhood adversity from my childhood. It's like, man, you just, the sh- when things that we've been through in my family, it's like, I don't know. I don't know if it's just, it, you know, that also contributed to this sense of like, I'm going to fucking be who I am, you know, like I'm not here to, to, to put on a fucking costume for anybody, you know, and there's something really powerful about just being who you are. You know, you know that your, your friends are your friends because of you, you know, you know what I mean? Like there's, it's just that genuine factor. And I want you to pull on that. And I want you to just maybe offer something in there because, you know, going back to that win, when you're accepting this world champion uh, title as a hundred percent Keala Kenley, you know, the power of that, you know, cause there's a lot of people right now who are kind of hiding behind or afraid to fully live and step into themselves and, you know, put that, that version of themselves out into the world. But you are proof that, you know, there's so much fulfillment and empowerment when you actually decide to do that. Well, I think it comes down to like, respect, right? When you are living your authentic self and you are unapologetically you, you know, like, like when, for example, when I came out as like gay, there was a lot of people that are not, you know, pro LGBT people, but they, they might not necessarily agree with how I am, but they have to respect you for, for standing up for who you are. You know, you, you teach people how to treat you. You know, if you are like hiding in the closet or you're ashamed or you're apologizing for who you are, you're teaching them that you don't deserve their respect, that, you know, yeah, you you should be, you know, you should have shame or whatever. And, um, yeah, so I think you, I think when you're authentically yourself, you're teaching people to respect you. And probably just the piece to add, and I love that, is because you have more self-respect for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like people are going to mirror. Self-love first. Yeah. How's that self-love going for you these days? 
a lot better than it was. I tell you. <laughs> and do you I think that it's my- an important piece? I hated myself for so yeah. long, just self hatred. I hated everything about myself, Roxanne. Like I hated that I was a girl. I hated that I was a Howley. I hated that I was not feminine. You know, I, I hated that I was uh, a female in a male dominated sport. Like I really felt like a second class citizen. I hated that I was gay. There was just so much that I hated and didn't want to accept about myself because I didn't feel accepted. So in saying that, would you say then that, you know, now that you have more self-love, like how, how is that impacting you as a whole in your life? Like just feeling more um, compassion for yourself, more appreciation for yourself, you know, all those things that come with self-love and even like the things that it's driving you towards. More acceptance. acceptance. Self-acceptance, you know, I, now I don't ever want to change who I am to please other people, you know, and that and was so not the case for like a really good chunk of the first part of my life. You know, I just felt like I was having to conform myself and censor myself and put myself in this box. And uh, yeah, it feels really good to just be like, fuck that. What about rejection? Because, you know, I know, you know, rejection doesn't fuck never feel good. But I do believe that when when you're bipolar, God, (laughs) because it just amplifies it. I hate rejection. And I dealt with a lot of rejection in my life, just like tons of it. And it just like, yeah, was really hard to deal with. Um, So do you feel that self having more self-love and self-compassion is a supportive, like self-soothing tool? to handle the, the hard parts that come with rejection, you know? Mm, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be able to deal with the the rejection now if it wasn't for like the self-acceptance for sure. That's a huge, I was protecting myself as well, you know? Yeah. Like when I had all that like internalized homophobia and self-hatred, like I was rejecting me too. Mm -hmm. Like, so it was just like double time. It's like, I'm feeling rejection from the outside world and then I'm rejecting me too. So when you stop rejecting yourself, you can deal with this a little better. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a powerful piece for sure. I mean, I think it's just, you know, people always ask me, you know, people point to me as like, um, disciplined. I'm like, okay, maybe sure. But I just really fucking love myself, which is why I do a lot of things I do. You know what I mean? (laughs) I've got no problem with self-love. Yeah. I don't know if I never had a problem with self-love. I mean, I've had a lot of hard shit that I've gone through, you know, from injuries to dealing with, but you've always had a lot of self-respect, you know, I've always had a lot of, thank you. That that's, that's true. That's really interesting because even if I was feeling something inside that wasn't really sitting with me in that, like, oh, you know, I feel so good. But when I walk out the door, it's like, yeah, the head's fucking level with life. And like, like, let's, yeah, no, that's true. But yeah, it's yeah, interesting. The head tilted up, otherwise the crown falls. <laughs> okay, let's, um, I want to ask you, my she shed builder, um, I want to ask you, Right now, you know, day in the life of Keala, I mean, things are so different because right now people can't even, if you come to Hawaii, um, you know, you're quarantined for 14 days. Quarantine on, for incoming travelers. So that's just killed our tourism industry here. And my, my, uh, my like secure, uh, the job that I, that I count on, you know, mm-hmm. for, for a, a consistent income is uh, DJing. So I had, I had two DJ residencies pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, this really nice hotel in Waikiki called Alohilani Resort. I loved my residencies. You know, I it made me really happy, and it was stable income that was paying my rent. And now with COVID, like you know, I don't know when I'll get those residencies back or when tourism is going to pick back up. I mean, nobody wants to spend the money to fly to Hawaii to then be quarantined into a hotel room and be paying like. <laughs> you know, Hawaii prices on a hotel just to like sit in a room all day. Like, yeah, yeah, that's just not conducive to getting the tourists back. So, so let me ask you, you know, what have you, have you made any gains through the quarantine 
COVID chapter that we've been living in? Is there anything that has been, you know, where you can look at and go, well, you know, I've, I've, you know, created this or I learned this or I've added this. Is there any kind of gain? Yeah. I mean, I, I, <laughs> no, your volume went down for a second. Oh, I did it. Okay. Yeah, you brought, you brought, you put up. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, like, uh, my little bipolar brain needs to stay busy. Like I need to like give it treats. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep my mind busy. Otherwise I'll spin out a lot of times. And so, you know, I think, um, I just moved into a, a, a place with my roommates in, in Kaneohe Bay. They got a, like a nice new house and, uh, they had some painting projects they wanted done. So I literally painted like almost every room in this house. <laughs> <laughs> and then when those were all done, I was like, Oh, another th- they, they, they extended the quarantine another month. And I was like, I need a bigger project. So I, um, I've done a little bit of building, as you know, like I've helped you with some like home. Oh, KK is no, hold on. I, I feel like KK has like another fucking fantastic career life in building. So many careers. <laughs> so so many careers. <laughs> yeah. You are a multi-talented woman. You literally, she has done so much for, for my home, um, inside and out. It's crazy how you can conceptualize small spaces, um, yeah, you're so talented in that way. So sorry, continue. It's surfing that makes me so spatially aware, but, um, maybe, yeah. So I, since we moved in this house, like I live with, um, one of my roommates is a, is an ex pro longboarder. So she's got a whole collection of longboards. You know, her wife is, does stand up paddles. So we've got all these sup boards and then I've got obviously all my short boards and all my guns. So we've just got a lot of water toys, you know? Um, and it was just like taking up the entire garage and we just didn't have a really good place to store them. So I saw a need for something and mm-hmm. I like to build. And so, you know, I just get like these pictures in my head uh, and I do a couple little rough sketches and then I just let the bipolar hypomania just take over. <laughs> You know, so funny. (laughs) Like I let it run wild and I just am able to do these things that like, I've never built a structure of that magnitude. Yeah, I really built a fucking fortress. Like when I step back from it, I'm just like, (laughs) I can't believe I built that. I mean, a thing is like 14 feet high by like 16 by four feet deep. Like it holds 20 surfboards and like has shelves for board bags and these like awesome sliding barn doors that I custom built and hung, you know, I barely got any help making this thing. I obviously had to get, you know, for some of the bigger posts and stuff, you know, my brother holding them while I secured them. But I mean, I pretty much built this thing just about by myself, you know, uh, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, you're, it, it is. It's so you guys for, um, you know, obviously people haven't seen it, but I've seen it and it's like a little studio apartment. It's crazy. It's so big. When you stand next to it, it's gnarly. Um, what I love so much too, is just that, you know, a lot of people, um, can, can, can all of a sudden become really paralyzed by, you know, challenges period. Um, you know, if we speak very specifically about the challenges that, you know, we're facing right now as a whole, it's like, it could be really easy to just stop. Like you, you know, you're saying like your life right now, you know, you've gone from, I'm traveling around the world, I'm surfing different waves. I'm also traveling as a speaker. I'm also traveling as a DJ. I also have this, you know, residency as a DJ that's stopped right now. So there's a lot of, you know, your life literally is just completely fucking come to a halt, you yeah. know, everything that you're March, used to. March was definitely a rough month, you know, just in that yeah. transition where everything halted all at once. And it was right. just like, whoa, I definitely almost spun out into, I, I definitely almost spun out into a gnarly bipolar depression, but I was able to like pull myself out of it with projects. <laughs> but, but that, see, I, see, I'm such a layered thinker because I never look at things. Oh, so you're um, just a me, Sue, baby. <laughs> No, it's true though, because I like to go deeper and deeper and kind of get to like the root of things, you know, which is why I love integrative medicine because we're looking at the fucking root of the, of the issue here. But when I look at the root, when I think of Kiala, you know, uh, building her she shed, I look at Kiala and I'm like, Kiala just doesn't stop charging forward 
testing herself, seeing what she's capable of, using her imagination, not letting her environment, the stressors of her inner and outer environments fucking stop her from yeah. moving forward. You just, just got to pivot. You know, sometimes like it takes a minute because you're processing, like, especially like with this COVID. I mean, it was a, just an extreme e brake pull. <laughs> You know, so like while the car's spinning and careening, like you got to like process and then, yeah, you just got to reinvent and uh, pivot, shift your, your mind and focus and energy on something else. I've had to do that so many times in my life yeah. that I think it gets easier, um, you know, where I shifted from pro surfing to acting to big wave surfing to DJing. And then and now I'm kind of like shifting into more public speaking and motivational speaking, you know, the stuff that the work I've done in, um, yeah. Fighting for equality, you know, you just keep, you just keep pivoting. Yeah. You keep, you keep, I think you keep, it's like you're pivoting, but you're also pushing, you're testing your, you know, it's like this idea that you never really know what your limits are until you get close to them. Right. To, to understand. <laughs> I feel like you're <laughs> fucking quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We both like, I'm like, I feel like you're the queen yeah. of that. Do I understand that concept? Hmm. Okay. Wait. So I have to ask you because KK, you, I literally think you should do some stand up too. All of your career. I mean, <laughs> when I was a little kid and you, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I wanted to be a, uh, like the best surfer in the world. And I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be a comedian. And I feel like I get I to just- yeah, I feel like I get to do all those things, you know? I feel like music is artistry. I also, you know, whatever, do my, like, surfboard art or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah I, that's what I was going to say. Like, you're so good with your hands, sketching and drawing. You've always been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just and building things is an artistry. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I feel like with, like, the public speaking and stuff that I'm doing, mm-hmm. I get to, like, have that kind of comedic, timing and stuff. So I feel like, you know, in a roundabout way, I've gotten to like check all those boxes. You're living the dream, girl. <laughs> I wait, oh, dude. So wait, it's that's so good. It's so true. Um I gotta ask you because during the the when we were in like in the, the heaviest parts of quarantine, you and I were were sharing some of the memes. I think that the memes are literally like the best thing that came out of uh the COVID quarantine. For me it was the memes uh, I think my favorite meme, and the to- I mean, the toilet paper memes were just like so good, so funny. <laughs> the like hand sanitizer memes were so funny, but uh, I think the one that that just stuck out for me, and I still just like giggle every time I look at it, was like was just words. It wasn't even a picture. It was um, January first, twenty twenty. This is gonna be my year. March thirtieth, twenty twenty. Wipes ass with expired tortilla. <laughs> It's just, I don't know why that one just like, just struck such a Because it's like almost really real. It's like. (laughs) And the expired tortilla just was the fucking capper, you know? But I feel like, yeah, I feel like the best thing about out of COVID was the memes. And also just uh, the environmental impact of seeing like, yeah, what the world would look like without all the humans out driving and you know yeah. all the carbon emissions. Like, oh my yeah. god, like the sky got clean, the water got clear. It was just like, yeah. yeah, look at what we're doing to this planet. Like, wake up call, everybody. Yeah. You know, and like, let's rethink this as we reintegrate into the world again. You know, yeah, um, yeah, no, totally. The yeah, got a break. Yeah, the other. Uh, I think positive thing that's going to come out of coronavirus is just the dental hygiene is going to be more of a priority because people are wearing the mask, they're smelling their own breath. <laughs> I was like, where's she going with that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, people really need to rethink what. <laughs> When you're when you're encapsulated in your own essence of your own bad breath, um, you really <laughs> oh my god, about, you know, flossing <laughs> and um, dental hygiene. Keala, I fucking love you. I actually think that there's gonna be some comedy, like I don't I've, know I've something. Been I've been flossing a lot more <laughs> uh, in comfort. 
I always fall. I don't know how one can't floss. Like that would personally, I just would feel incomplete. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I love when Kiala does that, you guys. Mm. <laughs> It's like, it's not good enough to make me cackle. I'm processing it. <laughs> I agree, but yeah, it's on an expired tortilla. I'm taking a beat. I'm taking a beat. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question that I'd love to ask all of my guests. If you had a magic wand and you could impact the masses, like magically take this wand over the masses and give them a habit that would have the most positive ripple effect in their life, what would it be? Mm, I'm going to say empathy. I'm going to say empathy because if, and, and just, yeah, being able to put yourself in other people's shoes and like, and really feel things from another person's perspective, uh, I think would just make the world such a better place. Like I try and live by the golden rule and like treat others the way I'd, I would like to be treated. So if you think of like, just some of the just awful things people do to each other, you know, I think if people had more empathy, you know, there wouldn't be racism. There wouldn't be like, you know, um, bullying and bullying, yeah. like all of it, like just all the bad, all the hatred, all the, just the bad things that people do to each other. You know, um, if everybody just had more empathy and could feel things from other people, yeah. uh, I think the world would just be so much more of a compassionate, um, nice place to live in. I love it. I agree. Yeah, for sure. I think empathy and compassion are, are really, really, um, you know, they're tools for a human to really, uh, I feel you could be a, a stronger contributor in life when you, when you, when you are more compassionate, when you are more empathetic because you maneuver through life with more consideration of others. Yeah. And we all got to fucking live here together and, and do our best, you know? And I think that when you are considerate of others, you know, as, and on a deeper level, it does help you to service others as well. It helps you to show up every day as an individual that, you know, cause I always say like, we're not just, I'm not just Roxy and you're Keala and I'm a woman and you're a woman and you're, no, you're a fucking experience and I'm an experience. And every human is an experience. And I give you an experience, you give me one. We're giving the listeners and the watchers right now one. We're always giving an experience to whoever it is that we're coming across. And when you have more compassion and more empathy, um, you are able to show up and give the individual that you or people that you are coming across like just a better experience as a human, you know? hundred percent. Yeah. 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 If we, if we all give that to each other, the world is going to be such a nicer, more pleasant place to live in. Like everybody's just so cutthroat and out for themselves and just never considers other people, you know, and just always puts themselves first. That's yeah. more of the, yeah. There's more of that than the other. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you before I go into rapid fire words, um, which is something I always do with my guests too. Is there anything that we haven't spoke about in this episode that you want to live in this talk? Um, I mean, we talked about a lot of things and I mean, heads up, we're fucking, you're my, we got more podcasts to do together. I can't wait to be in real life and do one with you. Like that dynamic will be so rad, you know, but just, um, is yeah. there when you're laughing, you're going to be fucking elbowing me, <laughs> punching me. <laughs> Gonna be think positive. about Mary. Gonna be oh my god! Comedy movies to do in the theater. Like I would just get my ass kicked. Oh my god! I specifically the something about Mary. Right? We watched that movie, and I actually remember I couldn't help it. You guys, you know when you're just like you like it was hurting me because there was so much humor that was trying to come out of me, and I didn't. I my body couldn't process it, but Cal was right next to me. I was getting smacked. <laughs> and so the only thing I could do is like, hand, like, her, like, 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 I'm so glad I'm not there next to you because she would be smacked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, it, well, it's happening. I'm, I can't wait. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you um, in real life. So, yeah. So is there anything that you want to live in this talk? Is there something that you wish you were asked more that you're not asked? Or And no worries if not, but 
No, I mean, I feel like we covered all the bases, really, like, um, you know, the mental illness, the, the equality, like we. It, yeah, cool. Yeah. Perfect. Are you ready for rapid fire words? Yeah, let's go. All right, here we go. You don't got to be rapid. Top of mind, top of heart. Love. Everything. The reason we're here. <laughs> the meaning of life. <laughs> I love love too. It's the best. Like everything else is all filler, you know, like job, career, like all that stuff. Like we just fill the space with that, but we're just here to love and be loved. Like that's why we're actually here. Like when people ask like what the meaning, you know, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? To, to me, it's just so fucking simple. <laughs> <laughs> and also how, love like, is such how a could you even ask that? It's just so simple. It's like love <laughs> and it really fuels so much of what you know some of the greatest accomplishments that yeah. you know yeah i mean everything that you've done and are doing is i mean would you say is being fueled by love fueled by love fueled by fear they're the two power most powerful motivators oh cool because the next word is fear <laughs> <laughs> motivating no <laughs> yeah I, I feel like i've had a, a guest say that before too it is motivate motiva fear is motivating it will make you do things it's going to make you react you know it's going to make you fight or flight That's um, so true it, fear i mean i could use the word paralyzing mm -hmm. as well like um terrifying yeah uh, but also mo it, it, can, it can be a huge motivator yeah, I agree. Fear is absolutely a motivator as well. A strong one. Next word. Ready? Mm. Challenge. Challenge. Challenge is just a speed bump in the road. <laughs> a challenge is something just, you know, put there to, to push, push you harder to overcome, you know? Challenges just make you dig deeper. That's all. I love that. I agree. Curiosity. Mm. Curiosity. I think of um, just being very inquisitive and wanting to know more, like a like a a thirst for for knowing. I guess. Yeah like a discovering there's yeah. For, yeah i love curiosity it's like it fuels everything in my life it's like that layered thinking you know i'm talking about it's like i'm always curious about like where does that come from what's underneath that you know um well, like when you're looking at but why though yeah so, yeah and you're like but why but why it's, that yes i love that it's so it's so healthy to, to question like that but why but why um yeah i can go on and on about about curiosity uh but to keep it moving next word you ready hmm. courage 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 is uh courage is just inner strength courage is inner strength courage is uh courage is self-empowerment where you where you um overcome the fear you know Courage is that, is that fire. Yeah. It's like you feel the fear and you go anyways, right? Yeah. Courage is Kayla. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> like, courage. Girl in the background, this big wave, this big. <laughs> Dude, it's gnarly. It's so, for people who don't know, I mean, I've had the privilege of being out there, you know, and there was no real swell but just being on a boat out in the middle of the ocean at Chopo, it, it, like there's a fucking energy out there that just oh, yes. is yes. Co So it's like, can't even imagine to, I wouldn't even want to be in the boat when there's, you know, massive swell. Cause we, we know that some of the boats get, you know, Oh my God. Like out. I was reminded recently of like, when I went back after my facial injury, I took, um, my friend Ashley, who was like a film producer and she wanted to like shoot me surfing, you know, like we didn't know what we were going to do with it, but we were like talking about like maybe reality show or something, you know, we wanted to 
she wanted to come film me in Tahiti. And this was like my big comeback after my, my facial injury. And so I went out and just got like, literally like one of the best barrels of my life. Um, might be the best barrel of my life. I came out with the spit. Everybody thought I didn't make it, but she was in a boat. I got, I was able to finagle her into like the photographer boat, you know, which were like, goes like, you know, as close in as possible to try and get the shot. And I don't know what happened, but I don't know if the, like the engine like stalled for a second or what, but all of a sudden this freaking set came and like the boat, like did not make, like it punched. Oh my gosh. But then when, Oh back. my gosh. And like everybody flew out, camera gear flew out. And like, she was from LA. Like she was not a, like a yeah person. Like she, she was. That dead. is so gnarly. So gnarly. <laughs> Over the falls on a In boat. A boat. A <laughs> That's a nightmare, KK. Yeah. Which is crazy. And for those who don't know, like when you, so you're like, oh, when I got my facial injury, when your face got sliced open, which side note, you know, I'll never forget because, you know, you've been surfing this wave. You're literally crowned the queen of Chopo and, you know, you've been surfing this wave forever, uh, charging, you know, building sized waves there. And then I remember watching this. Yeah, that, that exactly. Um, you know, where Laird Hamilton, like the god of you know big waves i mean he came out of one barrel there like and had tears i mean this place is heavy right and i remember um i think it was like uh it was a it was for andy right it was that competition and i was watching you online oh wow words yeah no i literally remember the moment where you took off on the wave that tore up your face that, you know, if you look it up on the internet, you guys, it's like, it, there's a lot of, um, you know, when there's like a graphic thing, like it stops you from seeing the image um, because you, it it's like, graphic. it's war- it's warning you basically. Um, but I remember seeing you take off on, and it was, it was a small wave. Oh, small. Okay. Whatever. No, but in comparison, in comparison to what we were riding a few days before, cause I had actually gone down the chase, like the code red swell, which is the biggest. Yeah. swell I've recorded at Chopu and, you know, got definitely not as big a waves as the boys or like Nathan Fletcher is just ridiculous biggest wave ever ridden there. But, um, I got a couple waves. I got some really nice barrels and I, I came out pretty much unscathed. And then literally a few days later had one of the worst injuries in my life when it got back down to civilian size, you know, so you just never know, you know, <laughs> I, sh- I didn't, I saw you take off and I, and, and you, you did your thing like a little bit. And then all of a sudden you didn't come up, got taken out. You didn't come up. And I was like, huh, what happened to KK? And then all I know is like a fucking next day or whatever, two days later, you know, I'm picking you up at the airport and you, your face. <laughs> was like, like Shrek, dude. I look like your, like, your face was swollen. so swollen. I remember that. It's so gnarly. I mean, okay. Back to the words, but just had to put that in there because a, it just naturally happened. But also just to say, you know, the fact that you, you know, you got your face tore up, could have died. Like you could have been blind. So many things could have even been worse than that gnarly injury. And you still paddle out and charge it. Like you went back out and that's, that's a piece that, you know, if there's again, like if there's a through line to you and to your life, it's like you, you constantly, you know, you push, you, you test your limits, you push your limits. You're always looking to see how much further you can go. You take fucking hits in Mm. the process. Yes. No. And then you, (laughs) but you get back up and sometimes the get the getting back up part is just you know it's it's really hard like sometimes harder than the others, um, but you come back with a fucking swing. You well, know, the back is the best setup for the comeback, baby. Like you know, say it again. Setback is just preparing you for that comeback. So good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love you. Okay, two more words. I'm gonna get you out of here. Um. I like it's three passion. Passion is that like fire that burns in your soul. That's what passion is. Passion. I have, I have that shit in spades, girl. Yeah, <laughs> you really do. I'm a fucking inferno. <laughs> you, <laughs> you really are. And I'm a Leo, so I'm just yeah. Just, I was really just thinking that I'm, too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> when this podcast comes out. 
it's your birthday. Yeah. Which is so exciting. Happy birthday. I love you. I'm saying yeah. it now. Oh my God. <laughs> um, okay. birthday, I'm sure. I'm sure we're going to go back into another lockdown here pretty soon. Our numbers are spiking. So whatever. <laughs> what will she build? Um, okay. Yeah. We're building yeah, it. I'm, I'm eyeballing my next project. I think I want to build some like pool loungers or something. I definitely need to get busy on a project. Perfect. Again. Cause when I get my ass there after all this shit, I'll be lounging on those bitches with you. Lounging, right? You're that's you're right. <laughs> reclining comfort. So yeah. That's next. Uh, r- next word is resilience. Resilience is just never giving up no matter what. Resilience is just never giving up. Beautiful. Final word. Excellence. Excellence is excellence is the ultimate, the optimum, what you're striving for. Excellence is the goal. It's the ultimate goal. <laughs> that touched me in a way because I feel like as you said that, I just, my brain, what a privilege. I was able to, my imagination just went through all the years back and and as your best girl witnessing you at your side like in you know in, in your competition like the CT and just the competitive side of KK when she's paddling out and you know your hunger to fucking win um that's where my mind just went when you when you said that it was a fun it was a fun it was a fun Hello, one. did you have a fun journey welcome back I, I did <laughs> I was exactly <laughs> Yes. I love you. Thank you so much. I miss you. Um, first podcast of many more to come. Not last, not last for sure. We got to do one uh, live and in person. Oh, for sure. No, we've got, we've got many. I mean, this podcast is, is, it's just sprouting, you know, like I'm just getting warmed up, but I'm so oh, proud. Yeah, I'm just not going to stop. You know? <laughs> It might, it might not. I mean, there's definitely some more surfing goals, but you know, I just, uh, there's some like equality and just like, you know, social impact goals that I'm have that I'm chasing now. So it's just going to get bigger, you know, that are keep that you're like, yeah, I'm just, I really want to end inequality, like in all, in all women's sports and then, you know, have that transfer over into just everything, you know, the, the boardroom, uh, the workplace, you know, I feel like we were able to accomplish that in surfing, which is just like such a small sport, but that is just, that's the start of the domino effect. You know, I want to get all the best women athletes in the world together, uh, and fight in a, on a united front to end equality in, in every sport, you know, instead of each of us fighting individually for our sport, like, great, we got it in surfing. Cool. That's our sport. Like, you know, some people would quit there. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that's mine. No, I want to, I want, I want to get the soccer girls what they deserve. I want to get the WN girl, WNBA girls what they deserve. You know, I want all of us to win. I love it. And you know, what's cool actually, um, that just came to my mind is like, when you're like, it's small, it's a small sport. It actually, I feel like that makes it harder because there's less eyes on surfing than there are in the girls, you know, the soccer girls as an example. So if you can do it, in a sport that has less eyes, which ultimately also means less money, right? Then you can do it in. It can be done. It's going to yeah. happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's a matter of time, you yeah. know, and you just got to keep driving forward. Mm-hmm. And I, you'll- I'm resilient as fuck. <laughs> I know you are. That's why you're my girl. She's on I'm the front line. So, like- so, I'm so stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a theme with my closest. Um, we like to win. Yeah. Like, the Michael Jordan documentary, like this, he's just, he likes, he love, and not in some like, you know, I'll just keep it simple. We like to win. We like to set our minds to something that we want to accomplish and we want to fucking crush it. Right. And then when you, reach that, you reach that goal, you need a bigger goal. When you reach and that then- goal, you need a bigger goal. You know, it's like, yeah, I'll just never be satisfied, you know, like, yes, we won uh, equality for surfing, but like, okay, that was that, that now I need a bigger goal. Now we got to go bigger. I'm always going bigger, bigger, bigger. 
Yeah, you are. <laughs> Whether it's in surfing or in life, you just got to keep going bigger. Boom. That's the end. I love you. <laughs> yeah. You guys, Keala, the best place to stay connected to you, Instagram, all your stuff. What are your... Yeah, I'm mostly on, I'm mostly on Instagram. You know, I have a Facebook, but I, I just kind of... I don't like to be on... There's just too many, like, you know, I, I didn't get on TikTok, you know, I never got on Snapchat, you know, I just, uh, I like Instagram, I like pictures, you know, I like to flip through like a magazine. Um, so yeah, you can find me on Instagram at mm-hmm. Kelly Kennelly. Cool. Um, Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. That's there. All right, you guys stay connected to my girl. I love you. Um, I'm going to keep us going after this, but stay connected to my girl. You guys, I love you so much. KK. I can't wait for the next one. We finally did this one. Me too. (laughs) To be continued. Bye guys. Bye bye. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode, you guys. If you loved it, please share it on your social. Throw it up on your Instagram stories and tag me. I'm at Black Belt Beauty. I am also at Roxy Look. R-O-X-Y-L-O-O-K. I love connecting with you guys. This is a conversation that I want to just continue growing with you guys. So if you feel inspired to hit me up, do so in that space. I always enjoy hearing from you. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by rating it and reviewing it via iTunes. It's such supportive help, you guys. It really helps the visibility of this podcast. So I appreciate and thank you in advance for doing that. And last but not least, if you you are interested in starting your own podcast or perhaps you already have one and you need help with you know editing your audio and the production of it I cannot recommend my producers enough resonate recordings you guys they are the bomb I rely on them they are an absolute supportive tool to me and my podcast so check them out and let them know that Black Belt Beauty sent you and on that note you guys I'm signing off with all my love and always looking forward to catching you on the next Oh,